Thank you for that introduction. Um, just a few words about data intensive computing and how we're thinking about it these days. Um, I guess uh, between data intensive computing and cloud computing, they could be just buzzwords that you know could mean almost anything, um, or anything could be meant could uh, be perturbed to correspond with those. But um, I want to give you a few thoughts because uh, we, we think about it a lot at, at SDSC and we're building a new supercomputer, Gordon, which uh, will be online um, um, uh, first part of next year. And a lot of its design has come from thinking about the data problem. So, you know, oh, so, so one more buzzword that we hear a lot about is exascale computing, right? I mean, um, and you hear that we're getting into an exascale regime. But if you look at data and you just ask, how much data is there? How much data is there in the world? That's a big question. And uh, a recent UCSD report, it's kind of an old report, a 2009 report concluded that there were z zeta bytes of data uh, that were being consumed by the end, by the end consumer. They, they, they interpreted data as stuff that people viewed and their brain interacted with. So admittedly, a lot of this data was television, <laughs> and, you know, so so data may not correspond to uh, highly important information. Um, <laughs> um, nevertheless, you know, and a zeta byte is not made up. That that's ten to the twenty-one. That's a thousand exabytes. Um, so it's a lot, and. Um, you know, maybe it's also fair to ask, well, how much information? You know, there's data, then there's information. How much of this is unique? How much of this is scientific information? And um, it, it's still easy to come up with the notion that it approaches uh, 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 zeta bytes of information um, and that it's growing exponentially, certainly, in, re in realms like uh, Facebook networks and just adding Facebook users and more and more data uh, about people getting online. now how much of that you want mined by uh, uh, automated search engines and, and supercomputers is yet a different, you know, sort of a sociological question. But where I'm going with this is that I think the data problem is bigger than the uh, flops problem. And I think the reason that, and that was a really good talk by the Microsoft uh, guy, the reason those lower power, I'm, I'm gonna show you why I believe those lower power processors are the ones that are, that are more efficient on real workloads, because it's not really about the clock speed of the processor anymore. It's really about how much time and energy does it take to, to move the data up to the processor, even assuming you have enough capacity to um, store the data to begin with. So in 2009, there were not data bytes, uh, th th there were not zeta bytes of disk. There was, uh, there was, you know, maybe 20 exabytes of disk. So the phenomena that you notice at home that you can't watch all your shows before your TiVo fills up um, and then you have to erase some shows that you haven't even watched yet to make room for new shows, that's a, that's a, problem that persists in science and, and business as well. Um, in getting ready to design Gordon, we were approached by genomics people on the Mesa at UCSD who just said, you know, we're, we capture data repetitively, and then we, but we wind up wiping away most of it for new studies before we have an analyzed, thoroughly analyzed, or in some cases analyzed at all, the, the, the previous sequence data. So, so just finding a place to store the data is a challenge, but assuming that you could store it somewhere, then the question becomes, you know, is there anything useful? Is there anything useful in there? So um, the problem is that disks are actually getting slower all the time. Um, I know that sounds ridiculous, but uh, but um, let me give you. Let, let me make that formal. If if, if you ask how much disk can I buy for a dollar, uh, that number in bytes basically doubles every 18 months by Moore's law. It's a, you know, sort of a, a density argument. So if you go down to Fry's, uh, you know, you'll get a certain number of bytes for the dollar, and if you do that a year and a half from now, you'll get twice as much. The speed of that disk didn't change, though. Really didn't change. Uh, every once in a while, someone has the bright idea to try to spin the disk a little bit faster, but 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 it can't be spun a whole lot faster. Um, and then if you ask, if, if you compute a very interesting metric, so I'm a metrics guy, and so I think a really fun metric, uh, my favorite metric these days is uh, uh, ratio of capacity to 
random I.O. ops. So a random I.O. op is I'm going to pick out a piece of data and then maybe that piece of data will tell me where to find the next piece of data. That's a very realistic scenario. It's like the Facebook problem. It's like saying let's, let's find the connectivity graph. Let's find the seven degrees of, of Kevin Bacon between Earl and, um, and, and, and Kevin Bacon. Well, we get Earl and we follow his friends and so that takes us to some new data on disk and then we find those friends and pretty soon we find Kevin Bacon. But, but the speed of that doesn't change on spinning disk, uh, you know, hardly at all. Um, and so that kind of takes us to this memory and data bound regime where we can't get the data up to the processors. Um, and not only is it slow, but it's real, real energy expensive. Um, a flop these days, a flop these days in energy, you know, we can talk about dollars or we can talk about energy because energy is also something you pay for. I mean, that's, a, that's an, electric, an electricity bill you have to foot. Um, you might get it cheaper up in Washington, but, you know, somebody has to pay that bill. A, uh, a, uh, a flop could, co could cost as little as a, as a, as a, as a Pico Jewel, maybe even, maybe even less. But moving the data up from this, this plot doesn't even deal with, uh, this is a Peter Kogi plot, this doesn't even deal with disk. Disk is horrifically expensive. If it's just si sitting in, uh, in DRAM somewhere, um, it's going to take, uh, you know, 100 picojoules. And if, it, and if it's uh, sitting somewhere on disk, it's literally going to take uh, uh, um, nanojoules. And those are very small. You know, how much does a nanojoule cost? Well, not, not, you know, not very much, but, uh, uh, you know, you don't, here, here's the simple math. <laughs> the simple math says that an exa times a nano is a giga. If you just remember that an exa times a nano is a giga, uh, then you'll then you'll be confronted with the power, the plausible power bill of an exaflop uh, computer if it actually has to access data. You know, now now if it's a Linpack specialized machine that doesn't access data very much but just runs really fast on a uh, on a sort of a made up benchmark, then then maybe it will. Uh, then maybe the power bill will be less than a gigawatt. But if if very many of those operations require it to access DRAM, um, unless we can do something, or disk, even worse, you know, unless we can do something to reduce that power cost per joule, we will have the container sitting next to a nuclear power plant. A nuclear power plant is approximately, the ones, the ones along San Onofre here, if you, if you drove down from LA, are approximately two gigawatts. So, so, you know, so, so we can't, that is a possible location for an exo, uh, exascale computer. But really we have to look at the energy problem. And the energy problem again is not coming from the flop so much as from the fact that when you compute A plus B equals C, that tells a computer, go get A, <laughs> go get B, add them together and store them in C. The adding together is what we keep getting really, really fast at, and it just gets faster and faster. But Omdahl's law tells us that after a while, uh, doesn't matter how much more we spend up, uh, speed up plus, if it's still taking us the time, same time to fetch A and B, and if it's still taking us the same amount of energy, once again, it doesn't matter how energy efficiently we do plus, we still have to fetch A and B. So. Um, you know, so 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 we had a bright idea that that uh, interestingly sounded kind of sketchy back in 2009, but I think now is probably most people would say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that was to add a bunch of uh, uh, flash um, to our memory hierarchy. So we have a bunch of spinning disk and we have a bunch of flops just like everybody, and a bunch of DRAM too, just like everybody else. But but we took a bunch of flash drives, and right now we've. We're running acceptance tests on about 300 terabytes of, of NAND flash that are integrated into our system named Gordon. And NAND flash is just, everybody knows, it's just faster random access, right? So, so in that case, with NAND flash, with a new technology, that ratio of IO ops per, um, per capacity improved dramatically. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hundredfold improvement in, in, in that particular uh, regime. And it's, uh, and, and since, you know, basically, one of these NAND flash drives takes about as much power, just kind of roughly speaking, as a spinning disk of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, comparable um, uh, size. Then it's much more energy efficient. You know, it's up to a hundred times more energy efficient as well, just just to access data. Now, um, you know, I'm always trying. I'm always 
uh, you know, so I've been doing this for years, and one thing that I've been doing for years is amusing myself by throwing stones at the top 500 list, which is always easy money. You know, I mean, people always get a kick out of the, out, out of that. But uh, but um, if if we uh, here, here's another metric that I think is interesting. Just take the sum capacity of some supercomputers. You know, let's take the top, the biggest ones on the top 500 list, and let, let and, and 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 fill in a spreadsheet that says how much. SRAM does that have? In other words, how much cache in bytes? How much DRAM does it have? Aggregate, the whole thing uh, in bytes. How much disk does it have in bytes? Now we're going to add all those up, but we don't want to quite add them all up because we don't want the most powerful supercomputer to, in the world to just be the biggest disk farm. Uh, we're going to divide every one of those units by the time that it takes to access uh, those bytes and, and uh, you could do it in seconds if you want to, but I like to do it in cycles, so I get a unit that is bytes, uh, bytes over cycles. Um, and I call that the data moving cap capability, or the data moving capacity of that supercomputer. That's a very simplistic metric, and we could get into really interesting nuances where we say, well, I prefer to give more weight to the one with a larger shared memory or a larger file system. Uh, are you really going to count all those separate SRAMs on the GPUs on the Chinese machine as one X? aggregate score, you know, that's just what I did in, in, this, um, in this chart. But when you do it, you get some real interesting things. For example, this, machine, th this chart claims that Tianhe 1 is still the most powerful supercomputer. It's not the Japanese K-machine, uh, but because it has more data moving capacity. And this chart also claims that Gordon, which is our new system, is more powerful than uh, Ranger and nearly as powerful as Kraken, although flops-wise, it's only about a third or less than a third. Um, but if your problem is data motion bound, then I claim that these kinds of rankings or these ways of looking at machine capability are going to be more, uh, you know, in increasingly important. And I claim the societal trend is such that more and more problems are data bound. You know, you know, you have that. You, more and more problems are looking like this mining of uh, of data for information where the locality is really unknown, you know, very similar. There, there's many problems that look kind of like the Facebook problem if you start to delve into it. And they range from like the Walmart problem of trying to do price correlations to uh, object tracking of, of, uh, of asteroids in the, in, you know, to, to, to try to discover new asteroids. They occur all over the place and, and I think they're of, uh, of, of, of increasing importance. So, so we're sort of deluged with a sea of data and yet challenged to build machines that can effectively um, um, mine this data. And so that's what I, where I think is sort of the, that, that, that's where our data intensive uh, challenges come from. So, you know, this is just a pretty little uh, uh, picture that just kind of says all of these things over again. A supercomputer looks kind of like a pyramid. It has a memory hierarchy of increasing size, but, uh, but also increasing latencies. It costs picojoules, nanojoules, uh, microjoules to move data up and down it. Um, uh, there are things you can put in the gap. So that's the, that's the neat thing is that people are making uh, new technologies. NAND flash is what we stuck in the in in, in the gap, um, but uh, there's new neat stuff coming along uh, as well. Spin torque um, uh, memories, uh, phase change memories, and, and and we like to think you know we have this term fad bad. What if you know what if you could have DRAM that was as big as disk but as fast as as DRAM or as cheap. Uh, uh, Energy-wise, uh, it's not it's not uh, it's not completely a pipe dream. There is uh, uh, there there is a device that was in the news recently from my colleague at, at UCSD. Uh, Moneta is a phase change based um, device that is nearly as fast on reads as DRAM. It's not as fast on writes. You know, it's not it's not a perfect world, but it's also non-volatile. You know. Um, Volatility is not a feature that any user uh, benefits from, as far as I know. I mean, let me know if I'm wrong. But what, what, what does a user really want? I think, I think a user just wants a great big sea of place to store data that is fast to access, and if it loses power, it should, uh, when I power it back up, it should still be there. So we, we could see a shrinking of the memory hierarchy on future systems. We could see systems that don't have so many you know, layers of, of, uh, of um, memory hierarchy. That those layers are simply a function of economics, you know, and and this kind of neat idea that, you know, Hennessy and Patterson, among others, kind of uh, championed back in the days of the attack of the killer micros, which is that they said a lot of applications have locality, 
a lot of times you move that piece of data, yeah, and you pay, you know, many seconds and microjoules to move it, but then you're going to mine it for a while. Well, um, you know, and when that works out, that's really nice because then you uh, can have a little bit of SRAM that is as fast as your processor, but uh, a whole bunch more DRAM that is not quite as fast, and, um, and a whole bunch of disk, you know, that's really cheap but but really slow. But the problem is, you know, what if your pro what if your problem, what if your data analysis problem doesn't fall in that category? How much data reuse is there in the Facebook problem? In other words, or, or the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon, there may not be a whole lot. You know, you pick me up, you pick up the node that is Alan, you look at, you know, how many friends does he have? Well, I have a lot of friends, but it's not an astronomical number. You know, and maybe there's two or three hundred, and then you don't access me again. You know, you move off from that, and you go, you go get some other data. Um, so, yeah, I'll have a little bit more to say that about that in, in, in a moment, but we are looking at the other side of the problem, getting back to why are these low power processors the more efficient ones. Well, I think we know that the notion is that if the processor is waiting for data, we might as well lower the clock frequency and spin our thumbs a little more energy efficiently while we're waiting for the data to come back. Um, that's certainly a good idea. Um, Going forward, we may see machines with mi much more aggressive energy saving modes. You know, we may just turn off the functional unit. We may turn off the floating point unit if we're not using it. It's not a floating point intensive uh, lo uh, uh, code, so we're not going to use that. Um, and, you know, traditionally, the use of uh, the extra silicon that we get every 18 months by Moore's law has been either to add more features or divide it up into, you know, that, that, that was the um, a trend for a while was to add specialized functional units and add a divide unit and add a, you know, some kind of a transcendental functions unit. Um, and then people got away from that. Well, uh, well, you know, if you remember, there was even crazier stuff. There were speculation units, you know, go off and execute this thread of code just on the chance that maybe it will get used later and validated if not. Um, then people stopped doing that and they started adding more and more cores, right? And, you know, you take that same amount of silicon and chop it up into, in, into more and more cores. But, and, and we got away from the specialized notion, but we may be seeing a return, especially with some of these people that work with Intel and, you know, Shekhar and, and Andrew, where we essentially over-provision over the chip with a whole bunch of, of uh, heterogeneous crap that can be turned on and can be used if that's what you're doing. Um, if you want an example of that kind of architecture, um, it, you know, it's right here. The, um, the, uh, the cell phone has all kinds of encoders and decoders and and uh, and antennas and stuff that just uh, they're there, but they're not all on at once. Or if they are, your battery runs down really fast. You know, if you have if you have the good if you have the the, the smart energy uh, management software, um, then it uh, uh, turns off the things that are not being used. And I think HPC systems, as we learn how to do that intelligently, may very well come to um, um, to look like that as well. And you know, and I like that saying that, you know, it's not the cost of the silicon, it's the cost of operating the silicon. It's turning on the wire. But, you know, what, what happens when you try to do this for real? Uh, I'll, I'll share a couple of anecdotes with you. Uh, we got a bunch of Intel processors. The processors come with a range of frequencies that they can be operated at. Uh, um, well, I can't make this thing work, but, uh, but uh, you know, between 1.6 uh, uh, gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz. Um, and you can even let the processor decide. So you could just fire up your HPC workload and let the processors decide. And what the processors would do is they would uh, use some very simple sort of local heuristics. And often, basically, what the processors would say: Look, if I'm waiting for data, if my cache hit rates have gone up, I'm going to slow down. I'm going to I'm going to uh, lo lower my clock. Um, we, we we tried that on some of our uh, Gordon prototype systems, and our power bill went up, um, and so and so we disabled it. Now uh, you know why did our power bill go up? Well, on further investigation, it was kind of obvious. We felt kind of stupid. It's it's a parallel code. A parallel code often has a slow runner. <laughs> often the slow runner is in fact the one that has some sort of uh, 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 bad data access patterns or, or more cache hit, uh, you know, m m more cache misses. Well, if you take and slow down your slow runner, you just made your parallel efficiency even worse. Um, so this introduced us to the concept that you need better, in HPC, you need HPC and parallel aware heuristics. Um, 
And so this is some work that we uh, uh, just uh, presented at Europar where we went ahead and implemented an applications-aware applications -aware view of the processor uh, frequency. Um, and we were able to show that for almost every loop, there is in fact an optimal frequency, and, and we covered all of the frequencies. The, you know, the, there, there were codes where it was really optimal to be low, there were codes where it was really optimal to be high. According to a metric like, say, uh, and we tried several different metrics, but, but uh, you, know, you could just use power delay. Now, if you're going to compute power, you know, power delay as energy, um, on the other hand, there may be some loss in value in delaying the job. So you, gotta, you would have to be willing to accept some delay in your job to, uh, to be willing to lower the clock frequency. But you can use other metrics like energy del delay um, and um, um, you know, penalize delay a little more harshly. But we showed in a number of regimes that we could, we could just uh, literally save power and still get the, you know, basically the same amount of work done um, on the system. And, and it's an example of what we're calling integrated hardware software stack. So just because the hardware has some nifty feature, like I will go into a low frequency mode uh, and save power, uh, it's not enough to achieve true power savings on a real workload. You need some information from higher levels, from either the programmer or the compiler or a performance modeling tool that says, well, I'll tell you what frequency you should run out because we're a team here, you know, we're solving a team problem. I need you to run this fast, but you don't need to run faster than um, um, this fast. So, of course, as you probably guessed, a great strategy was to take the fast runner, <laughs> you know, and lower their frequency, sort of the opposite of the ones that the local heuristic wanted to do, because since they were going to reach a barrier and sit idle anyway, it didn't matter if they took a little longer to do that. So you could do clever stuff like that. Um, we are making supercomputers out of bigger and bigger piles of little parts, right? Big piles of GPUs, big piles of uh, low power blue gene type processors. Um, as we do that, it's important to back up and try to think about what kind of problems are we trying to solve on the computers and what um, attributes do they have? Do they have locality? Um, do they have parallelism? Many, many people speak about exascale as being, the software challenge at exascale is to find this million-fold parallelism. But, uh, but let me tell you, as a person who works with applications, it's often a lot easier to find the million-fold parallelism than it is to find sort of the optimal level of locality that would work with that parallelism. Because you think about it, we're splitting up the problem into more and more small pieces. So we're making locality worse. We're, we're making locality even harder than it was before. We've got to find problems that uh, can be sliced and diced into even smaller pieces that only talk to each other, or we got to build real balanced systems. Now, you know, I was on the, or I guess I still am on the Blue Waters project, and I won't say anything that I shouldn't, but I will tell you that that machine had an astonishing uh, bisection bandwidth that was forecast for it. It would have blown <laughs> those other machines that I put up off the map in terms of its data moving capability. Now, it also had a lot of flops, but, you know, some people are going around moaning about, oh, you know, the 10, they're missing the 10. Uh, petaflops, but I'm not missing the 10 petaflops. I'm missing the enormous amount of bandwidth that was supposed to be there for moving data back and forth because that would have been a capability that you could have put that up against the K machine or the Chinese machine and, and we would have said, you know, if you're, if you're patriotic like me, we could have said, you know, we're still number one because we got this machine that is just so much stronger in that ca uh, capacity. Um, and I'll just leave you with the thought that if you actually take applications and measure their inherent parallelism and you in measure their inherent locality, you can plot them in a two-dimensional space and they're just all over the map, you know. There's some that are highly parallel, highly, highly parallel, um, but they have great locality too. And these are, these are some, some molecular dynamics codes, you know, that sit down here. Not all, but some, there's certainly Lintex that's down here. And you know there are codes that we don't know if there's any parallelism, so you know they're they're or they're very hard to parallelize. But there's a real tendency for us to build machines these days that's as good as this part, 
But there's an even stronger tendency for applications to look more like going up the axis. They have lots of parallelism, but they don't have a lot of locality. You can have a lot of uh, analysis engines moving on them, but that frequently have to communicate each other, like graph walkers. Um, and so, you know, another buzzword these days is co-design, and that's kind of a DOE. Uh, um, but but I, ho I heartily endorse that one. I really like that idea, is that let's look at the applications and ask what are their intrinsic properties in terms of parallelism and locality. And then let's think about building machines that at least, uh, I mean, we still have to be able to afford the machine, right? I mean, that, that was the Blue Waters uh, uh, moral is, you know, it might sound great, but uh, can you really afford it? So, so yes, economics comes into play, but let's spend the money, the energy, the, and beef up and over-provision the parts of the system that are really in the bottleneck for these codes. Um, and that's how we're looking at uh, data-intensive computing. And that's what we think Gordon is a little bit. You know, we spent some of the money that could have gone to accelerators on, it, on a lower level of the memory arc. And it's good for, it's really good for some applications. Um, my business manager will kill me if I don't say that, uh, you know, we're looking, actively looking for partners on this. And if you have a data-intensive problem and you want to try it out on Gordon, um, contact me. Um, we've had uh, some real interesting uh, cases where people really were able to make use of the flash. And it's, and it's definitely not everybody, but, but, but there are uh, data mining problems where that works. Um, that's about all I have to say.